someone have heard a lot of things I need someone to anyways life is too short to place any games now I'm determined I want to another game it's got to be perfect it's got to be perfect yeah too many people take second best no I've got to get a thing there's it's got to be yeah perfect hello hey this is Rusty Kelly and this is Amelia McKay. And this is our the sixth episode of the Breathing Problem Productions podcast. Woohoo! So congratulations, Amelia. Congratulations, Rosie. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we've been doing about one a week for a while, and then this is like the first kind of major gap. Uh, I mean, I think it's only like an extra week gap or so, but uh, uh, the stuff was going on. Um, uh, I have a new band called Discreet. It's kind of like a... An extension of Total Abuse, or I don't want to say extension. It's like a new band that has similar sounds. Y'all have been recording. Yeah, we recorded, so um, so that's exciting. Um, but this episode isn't an interview with a friend, and it's uh, not an analysis of one of our albums. Something we, new. <laughs> yeah, we decided we for a long time we were saying we wanted to do talk or um analysis about filmmakers we love um, mm-hmm. and films we love and this week we decided to watch rewatch four of our favorite films by uh, austrian filmmaker ulrich seidel um ulrich seidel yes <laughs> and um you know if th- okay so this is what's interesting is usually i'm pretty obsessive about wanting whatever we do in terms of like an analysis of a record i want that record to you know, for a listener to be able to look it up on YouTube or Spotify to where it's really easy for them to hear so they have a reference point, you know? And in the case of uh, Ulrich, Ulrich's films, uh, they're a little bit harder to watch. Mm-hmm. Um, like, I, I think I tried to... Because we own all these films on DVD, but uh, I tried to see which ones are available to stream. And I think the only film... Uh, okay, so there's four films we're going to talk about today. Animal Love, Models. Models, Import, Export, and Dog Days. Yes, and I believe only Import, Export is available to stream on some kind of weird streaming site that isn't one of the obvious ones. Um, uh, I think you have, it's, you, it's Googleable, Googleable. Uh, but it's, uh, you know, basically what I'm trying to say is kind of like forewarning that to see these films, you might have to, you know, go on Amazon and buy them or go on eBay or, or borrow one from a friend or search the internet in its various forms to try to find them, you know, kind of the old way of things, which was if you wanted to see a film, especially like a foreign film, um, you couldn't just in- immediately see it. Like we're so spoiled in that sense. Yeah. Which I, I'm glad to be spoiled with har- films, like to be able to see films you know, I was never a big torrenter, you know, where you like download films. Yeah. Because uh, I'm like not that smart. So, um, you know, like back in the day, I remember uh, the way I saw Import Export, uh, which came out in 2007. I don't think I saw it until 2009 or so. Um, and the way that I saw it was having to torrent it. Because it was just unavailable in America, you know? And by the way, um, um, I don't know. Needless to say, this introduction is just a warning that his films are harder to see. And so I know some people might be listening to this not having seen any of his films. Mm -hmm. But I hope that you can still appreciate it, still you know, be interested in it, and then hopefully it might make you be interested enough into to, to searching around and finding any one of these films, if that makes sense. Definitely. Um, so, uh, this is a filmmaker from Austria, born in 1952. Uh, I believe he made his career as a photographer, which is 
very obvious when you see his films. Mm -hmm. And I, and one thing that I think both of us believe makes his film so interesting is they kind of blur the line between documentary and drama mm -hmm. um, and kind of, to me at least, showcase how kind of pointless those lines are. Because, of course, we all know documentaries aren't the truth or reality, the objective reality, whatever that means. You know, uh, similar to documentarian Frederick Wiseman, who always kind of acknowledges how, through at least through the use of not having interviews, one-on-one -on -one interviews or voiceovers with his, uh, in his, his documentary films, you know, you're kind of, it, to me at least, Wiseman and through... Or Rick Seidel kind of acknowledge the manipulative tactics that all filmmakers employ, even those that claim to be documentarians. Mm -hmm. Also say like Warner Herzog's documentaries that it doesn't matter that like this is a documentary and so it's it's reality and this is a drama and therefore it's fiction. Uh, uh, Seidel, um, I guess you could say, crosses those lines all the time um, when you're watching his films some may seem more like documentaries than others like you could say to yourself in animal love the first film we're going to be talking about it's it claims to be a documentary about people obsessed with their animals mm -hmm. and then as you watch it you start to feel like oh well th that scene must have been scripted beforehand but then you realize how many documentaries say hey can you sit on this couch and talk to me about your pet which isn't you know reality yeah. right and then but as you watch the film and amelia and i'll talk about this more there's certain characters that you feel like aren't actually real people that might be actors and they're mixed in mm -hmm. and i think that he employs that a lot where he either uses non-actors or in some cases in other films that we aren't going to talk about i think he's purposely like been like three people are real people and one person is like a true actor right uh, again, this is the films we're talking about aren't his entire, you know, filmography. There's other films, later films, the Paradise Trilogy, which I don't know if you remember those. We watched them a long time ago, but like one was about a girl at a fat camp. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you remember that one. One was about a woman and her friends that go to that are from Austria and they go to like an island uh, resort to have sex with men. I don't know Vaguely. <laughs> yeah, and I like those films, but they're not as strong, at least in my opinion, as the ones that um we're going to be talking about um and I'm, i don't know i guess the best place to start is by saying to me and i'll say my version of it is that these films are so one of a kind because there's this complete blurring of non-actors documentary tactics if you want to call them that and dramatic drama and he uses them in different ways in different films in diff various strengths can you tell talk about what makes you love or be, appeal to these films do you remember the first time i showed you one uh i just i really distinctly remember dog days and animal love mostly and then i think we watched models later recently. more recently yeah and um i would just say like, do you remember me showing you any of these films at the old apartment? Is that when it was? Or uh, they, was it here, I guess? No, I can here, remember actually. Animal Love from, like, a way back years. in the day. I think we even, like, rented that one mm -hmm. and brought it to our old apartment to watch. Did you, I mean, you already were a fan, of, you know, of, like, Warner Herzog films. Um, and there's definitely, like, certain Herzog uh, documentaries that have this kind of blurring a little bit but not maybe as directly you know mm -hmm. um do you I, I don't know i think it's just interesting me and you when we watch things some of the earliest are my earliest like connections with you are watching films together yeah like watching i think we both watched like i showed you antichrist maybe or what maybe it was melancholia that we watched together for the first time mm-hmm um, so I think we've all, it's cool because we've always really loved films and talking about films together. Yeah. This was like, so we took all of last week to just sit and watch these movies again. And it was really fun. Yeah, it's been great. Um, so I, so uh, we were talking about, before we get started, talking about all the films, we were discussing just in general things we liked about him as a filmmaker. And 
we had just watched a small short interview where Rich Siddle had done talking about his films. Uh, did you have any thoughts regarding his, his little interview and what he thinks? Mm-hmm. Yeah, he just like said that um, he wants to show his audience the parts of society which we like are un- uncomfortable seeing. Mm-hmm. And to me, like I, I had this thought after we just watched this interview of like actually like a memory that came up in my mind of being like a little kid growing up um, on this little street in Georgetown and um, a few houses down there is like this little brick house where these like two uh, like young adult people lived with their mom I think we never saw the mom but they were you know I think they were probably just they they're they had like fetal alcohol syndrome or something mm-hmm. and um anyway the guy the the dude's name uh one of the sons uh was named Doug uh-huh. and he would walk down the street and knock on my door and he would want to talk to my dad and ask him for records and tapes. He's an adult, right? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And um, my dad would let him, like, he would just give him shit. Like, he like he would give him, like, all kinds of really amazing <laughs> shit. Just to listen to? Yeah. And um, and just the feeling, like, he, he didn't look like a, a normal person. You could say he had, like, his eyes were not, like, he had, like, a lazy eye and just being a little kid you you have this feeling of like maybe a fear of this person's different people than different me. yeah right. that are different from you or your parents or something and i think it's like there's like this uncomfortability like this this sense of discomfort that an audience would feel watching this mm-hmm. that i think is like we all kind of sense like it, how fucking weird it is that we all share the same like you know we're all human beings we're all conscious and like it's almost like this terrifying thought of being someone else and someone like that even though we all have these coping mechanisms that we don't even understand about like longing for love and happiness and like being separate from that at all times yes yes, in our society and Mm -hmm. our society teaches us that that that's what we have to do to reach contentment in our lives Mm -hmm. and like we are no different than like than than anyone else in that way yeah and i I think for me it's interesting uh, it might seem random but um i'm a big fan i know you are too of the youtuber king cobra jfs and um my my one thing i'll just say in relation to what we're just talking about is you know he's a he's this metalhead weird outsider youtuber that's been around since 2012 who lives in casper wyoming and he's a strange guy to say the least and um he lives in his room and makes wands that he sells online we have one of them and uh check him out on youtube he's interesting and strange but uh also my interest in watching him is you know he's constantly trying to find someone to connect with or be with And sometimes Mm -hmm. those things don't work. You know, he claims he's been in a three and a half year dry spell from sex. (laughs) And similarly, I think with Ulrich Seidel's work, you can laugh at the pain that we all feel trying to find connections. But you can also like connect with that person just like all humans can connect. So I think it's really interesting. And there's nothing wrong with like the act of watching this that's right. it's well no and hopefully we can um kind of connect with the human desire no matter how different we are to find those uh connections in life because life is so short and so cold and full of anger and hatred and despair but even e- even when people can't find love uh, there's something we can love about them for that but anyway i think it's cool uh so um so i guess what we're doing i don't know what it'll seem like edited is we're gonna watch clips and sections of these films so we can kind of more um 
have like a fresh take on certain aspects. But the first one we're going to start with, just in chronological order, is Animal Love. Now, I don't think this was his first film, um, but it's the the one that we want to talk about. Um, it uh, proclaims to be a documentary about people who have are pet owners and are interesting people who love their pets. Um, now, the tagline is uh, lonely people yearn for love, which says a lot. And yeah. also, um, there's a quote from Werner Herzog that says, Never have I looked so directly into hell. <laughs> which is the per- perfect quote mm-hmm. from a, you know, a filmmaker to another film. Um, <laughs> I th- when did this film come out? I believe it was the early 80s. Uh, I c- could be wrong. Um, I think it w- uh, was... 96? Oh, that's probably when it was... Re- well, let's look at it. Animal Love... Actually, okay, so it's from, it says it's from, yeah, 95, 96. It seems like a film that was made so much, like, in the 80s. Um, uh, but. Well, it's like <laughs> people um, who are, like, 10 years behind in the trends and stuff. Yeah, I mean, this film's shot in Austria. The director's statement was, the original idea for the film was a very was very radical. I imagined a film in which a man or a woman with their pet and all the things that a married couple would do. They talk, they eat, they cuddle and give each other attention or even go to bed together. In the entire film, there would be no communication between people. Wow, that's a cool idea. I love that. Um, that obviously, that's not completely what happened. But um, there is also kind of an interesting, like, um, like, such a alien perspective into these people with their pets and like like very detached like a cold eye watching them yeah which isn't to say there isn't like um emotion or but he he makes the dogs and the humans show that they're showing the same level of of intelligence in that way even in like communication it's all right affection and and like the need for the longing for love right Right, between the, you know, another tagline from another uh, critic was uh, more coldness, loneliness, and horror in a single film is inconceivable. So that's... (laughs) It's true. um, So the film opens in this strange, um, you know, everything is very European. I know I'm saying that as an American. What I don't know what the fuck that means, but everything... (laughs) You know, it's you can tell it's a, a different country, a different world to a certain degree, and... Uh, although it's still very Western and consumer friendly, um, but the film opens with a man in a barren room box looking. <laughs> yeah, with a mattress on the floor playing with his dog um, as they kind of wrestle around. And um, I think some people, even though this film came out before and was clearly made, I, th- I think it was probably made in the 80s and then it took all the way to the 90s for the film to be released, probably. But. Um, to some people, I think you even said this, is it reminds you of Gummo. <laughs> in the sense that, of course, I don't think he had seen Gummo. Gummo was made after this anyway. Uh, maybe Harmony Green had seen this film. But uh, in the use, similarly, Gummo uses actors and real people uh, to kind of blur the lines between documentary and drama. And th- you feel that in this similarly i don't know the if so if you if you're interested that i'd say gummo to a certain degree is a good uh, reference point if you're interested in seeing animal love but there's a perfect minimalism that exists in his films um uh, uh maybe models is is the uh this the kind of stand out from this but many of his films are you know scene after scene of a usually a camera on a tripod that's set up perfectly like a photo mm-hmm. you know he he um unlike you know i don't want to say wes anderson but in the sense that every shot feels like it's perfectly uh balanced and he knows the how he wants the um the layout of the shot to be how he wants the composition of the shot to be right uh in this or as we're watching animal love there's a shot of a woman reading to her many 
I don't even know what those are. Like terrier kind of dogs? I feel stupid now. Yeah. Um, I wish Shih Tzu we, we kind of dog. like a list of yeah. dogs. <laughs> She's reading to these little, this little dog tiny things. amount of dogs. And behind her is her room and her house and photos behind her. Um, and they're all, the whole shot is just very perfectly balanced and composed in a, in a, you know, cinema, in a, even a photographic sense. So you can mm-hmm. see his history of being a photographer in his films. Um, but I think with animal love, we're shown essentially a handful of different people that I think for the most part, these are real people that have animals. Right. Um, the, the reoccurring characters that I remember the most are a, for some reason, two, there's like two kind of middle-aged weird men who seem kind of uh, I wouldn't want to say on like the autism spectrum, but they seem a little disconnected from social <laughs> reality or skills. And, and they have a dog named Benjamin, bless the, his little heart. <laughs> yeah, and they have this dog. They don't know how to raise it. They try to train it. They try to it's control like it. It's aggressive and and a little a little unmanageable. As right. Like they dog. try to do like traditional dog training, almost like dog show training, like to heal and. Um, yeah. And uh, a lot of, you know, the shots, though, are them sitting in their kind of, like, apartment complaining about getting groceries, about food, about money, about bills, just about life. And that's what this... There's so much of this film isn't, like, a traditional documentary, like, um, where this is my dog, Betsy, and I love her so much, and we go to dog shows, and this is a quirky documentary about people who have pets... No, it's very much so about humans and the loneliness and need that they project on specifically these animals. Mm-hmm. So, so much of Ulrich Seidel's um, films are about human relationships and human identity. You just heard our dog bark. And human identity and the desire for love and connection. And I think each film kind of deals with that in a different way of like wanting to feel loved or to feel some not alone (laughs) yeah to feel sick to get something from life and um una and this film very specifically is people trying to feel connected through their pets una this is funny. I like that our dog is barking yeah, we're talking, while we're talking about right, animal love. We're talking love. about <gasps> animal love while our dog Come is here. angry at us for um, not giving her attention, okay. by the way, which Come we should here. keep this in. Um, <laughs> so I think as you watch these very barren films, you, you know, I was thinking of the documentary filmmaker Errol Morris, who... Uh, I'm not necessarily a big fan of. I don't think he's like a horrible filmmaker, but most of his films I don't have much connection to. Um, but as many people know, she did Gates of Heaven, which is about a pet cemetery, Amelia. I don't think you've seen it. But it's basically, um, I would say, like ground zero for hashtag quirky documentary, mm-hmm. where it's like this. It, it, to me, it's the opposite of something like Animal Love, where it's like, This is my American portrait of the real people, the strange people. This is like about a pet cemetery and the people who are obsessed with their pets and the minutia of what a pet cemetery is. And isn't it kind of strange? I know Earl Morris fans are going to come for me, maybe. But I'm not saying it's a horrible film. You know, it's a, you know, obviously it's like a classic documentary. But to me, Animal Love isn't a quirky documentary about pet owners, you know. Yeah. It's a brutal, bleak, ex- but funny yeah. ex- documentary about existence and those who deal with their existence through their pets. I don't right. know. You took like a ton of notes um, watching the, would, this one? No, I took a ton of notes for models and Emporia Expert. Okay, cool. But, but I mean... I feel like it, this one almost doesn't need it because like... It is what it is. Yeah, you don't even need to really like overanalyze it as much as like certain other ones because it's almost like this long these people like expose what they do on their own and their pets are just this like extension of themselves which they have like no 
boundaries like with you know Mm -hmm. and it's completely like inappropriate to the viewers to see like these it makes you very like uncomfortable like you're seeing something you shouldn't see right and and just what we were saying with the two men it's just like this kind of complete disregard for for like anything except for this like reaching out to this dog and like handling it like needing that to be needing the dog to like to give them the yeah the hope and like connection to, that they want right that the dog is somehow supposed to give them answers or feelings of but they're happiness. just deeply confusing the animal right and at the same time, right, just like right themselves. now, we're watching a scene of these two bumbling men try to uh, train their dog by walking it in a square and to heal at every corner. And the dog is just completely confused and upset. I mean, there's another scene of that's clearly real of them walking their dog without a leash and it runs up to a woman and starts fighting with a woman's dog. Who, yeah. Who has a daughter with her. And her dog has a muzzle on. So it's like it can't defend it itself. It's like terrible. It's this, like, like girls like screaming. Crazy. Yeah, it's it's like really. I mean, nobody is like truly hurt. Then there's another set of characters that I always that when I think of animal love, I think of these two characters. It's two oh, yeah. homeless men who essentially I'm assuming are squatting in some kind of like abandoned Austrian building or warehouse, mm-hmm. and they have a couple stray dogs and a rabbit or two. And they use their animals to panhandle as props in the subway stations of Austria. Which is illegal. (laughs) Right. And they, they, you know, this, these two guys could be their own documentary just because, you know, their relationship with their animals seems like half a desire to have love and affection in this kind of uh, outsider status in their society. But then also... Is that there's the opposite there yes we lo- you know you can tell they love their dogs they 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 want their dogs to give them something that they don't have but then they use their dogs as these objects to get money to make people feel sorry for them yeah which you know what i mean like the classic like oh i have an animal and i bet you're worried this animal isn't gonna eat so just give me the money right it's almost like blackmail in, in a way i mean yeah that's what we see in the stuff yes station, that's anyway. at least in this yeah in the documentary um and I think the name comes from like the dialogue that they that oh, they right. have together. Right, they're talking about animal love. They like ask ask the people of the subway station if they're animal lovers. Yes, yes. Um, he's there's a character that that one of the homeless guys claims he was found in a dumpster in Vienna, and he said that's when, when he was my, born. Yes, and that's when his great life began. Um, <laughs> I think it's, I wish these films were more available because I really think that they're unlike anything else. The closest things again are Herzog, you know, say Gummo or, um, like Titty Cut Follies, the Frederick Wiseman documentary, you know, documentary and documentaries. But, um, what Wiseman's films, which I'm sure we'll talk about him more someday, become very much so like socially, social films that, uh, still maintain his his very strict regimented style of no interviews or voiceovers but um something like titty cut follies has this beautiful surreal quality to it and it allows ugliness and even worries of exploitation to just be be out there in the open Mm -hmm. and i think after that wiseman decided to he needed to reel in his ethics of being a documentary filmmaker which you know that sounds fucked up like i'm saying oh has he got more ethical the films got worse no i mean all the films are good and interesting like hospital and high school but there's nothing like titty cut follies if you guys have seen it i don't know if it's like amazing right yeah it's, it's just completely again leak and depressing and life-changing right um but needless to say uh i think Ulrich Seidel's uh films are just completely one of a kind and i i wish they were more available um here before we move on i maybe i'll go through um a little bit more um let's see 
you know, there's there's like a great scene of the two kind of socially fucked up men. There's a shot of them, <laughs> one guy in the background on the, uh, toilet. on the toilet. You can almost see his stubby cock. And reading. And reading the one ads. <laughs> and the other guy looks like he's drinking wine like liquor or something. Or something. And, and they're just saying, no, fuck it. I don't need a job. That's a bad job. That's a shitty job fuck that, I don't want to work, you know? Mm-hmm. And uh, you're, I don't know, it, be, it doesn't even become about the animal, it becomes about this amazing portrait of these two men. Oh, oh. there it is, there's the fight. Uh, I don't want to watch that. Um, <laughs> um, I, I, so I wish I could just do a commentary for this whole film. But yeah. needless to say, you know, we, we have more films to talk about, but Animal Love is this harrowing portrait of people who are, lonely they're outsiders um some that are clearly rich and uh well to do but n- need so something lonely. yes that and need, unhappy that need something or try to gain something or get something i out think of... like sorry to no no keep going um my i think some of my favorite scenes are like um specific people that they focus on I would say it's like the people who are couples who have dogs. Yes. That's something that yes. I feel like that's my favorite part of this movie. I feel like is like a particular like part with like this lady and she um, just had her like husband leave her for another woman and they share this dog together and she's like talking to the dog about like, She's like, I'm your master now, and if you go back to your daddy, I'll beat you, and yes. <laughs> I'm your only like master. And- yes, and she reads a long letter uh, that she wrote to herself. It's not a letter. I guess it's like a diary entry talking about how her husband didn't want to be with her and left her. I think that's what it is. Mm-hmm. You f- feel like it. I think lots of people not are uncomfortable with his films because there's a humor in them, a self-aware, um, a, an awareness of what you're seeing, but also a deep, um, allowing of the like despair to just take hold of you yeah. that you have to allow the despair and the kind of well, immoral yeah. projections that they put on their animals to just be right. Well, but, but the film doesn't say like you have to hate these humans or that they're wrong. This isn't a documentary that's like, this is bad and these yeah. people are evil. Like, you know, it's not like Jesus camp or something. Uh, you it's know. just what they can do to feel love and, and these little critters, like they can't do anything to get away from them. You right. know, a lot of times you feel like you're seeing animals confused, wanting to pull away from people. The ones that are grabbing too tightly aggressively like mm-hmm. in this like love me right yeah. yeah i mean and so many inappropriate scenes where people sticking their tongues and dogs mouths yeah, yeah, in this yeah. movie um <laughs> 14 days your mistress has been alone with you without your master um <laughs> we're watching this and um, i hope he kicks the bucket and all his brains come out um i mean it's genius like the whether it's dialogue or it's something she really said it's just such a moment right whether i don't and i don't think he, this is something that he he wrote i think this is true with her there's a scene though with a woman who is like an older more beautiful woman who seems like she's rich who has a husky of old dogs that's what we have <laughs> um and it shows her like reading old love letters like men who wrote to her admiring her um, sexual letters right and the dog just kind of sitting with her i, I don't the, and then she gets all dressed up with the dog in the bed and, and like has sexy him. time well, she doesn't have sex with the dog no but... it's more just like let's like cuddling but it's right. like really that was weird. actually that shot is more, that little section is more like his original idea of a dog being like the other half of a relationship mm-hmm. and that's the one that's the most clearly fake yeah. Weirdly enough. So maybe that was an early, sh- that was an early, like, you know, part of the that. film. Um, so actually, weirdly enough, I saw this film back when Netflix first started doing streaming movies in like 2010, 2009. Animal Love was on Netflix back when there wasn't that many films on Netflix streaming. Crazy. Yeah. And I had already seen Import Export and I was like, what? The- 
this like i hadn't heard of it i didn't know that this was one of his other movies and uh needless to say was completely blown away but um okay i guess we can move on um okay so now we're back um so now we are putting on Models, uh, the film he made after Animal Love, which I believe was shot right after Animal Love came out. I believe it came out in 98, at least in Europe it did. Um, so I be- it was probably shot in 96, 97. Um, Models is a uh, documentary or film that claims to be about the modeling industry. Yeah. Um, and this one is I guess Amelia and I's favorite or close to if, if I would are. say like uh for me at least like it I would say like models and import export are both my favorite out of all these these four. Right. Um models is definitely more chronological compared to the rest of his films with yeah. just like he, more... with with something that we both love and like admire from his films is the kind of like parallel or juxtaposition between different character timelines and shots. Where it's like more where, non-linear. Yeah, and different stories play out. And in models the films. is very like the beginning to the end is very chronological. Right, and the storyline all leads to the next scene to the next scene right. and has to do with each other. And, so that's kind of the difference. Yeah, and so I'd say what's interesting about models and and you could even compare it to another documentary, there's plenty of documentaries about modeling industry, but um more recently we had seen um Frederick Wiseman's documentary from the 80s model, you know? Yeah. And that one's like even though Wiseman is his own type of documentarian, it's still very kind of traditional. It's a great documentary, but it's like, here's the modeling agencies and here's the kind of interviews that they have with people. It's about a New York modeling agency in New York in the eighties. And here are the jobs that they go to. The mundane aspects of photography or taking photographs of these girls who are, you know, making these ridiculous phases while they're posing. Right. And like, yeah, and it's there's this kind of it shows the physicality of it. You know, oh yeah, Wiseman's a Marxist part. for sure, and I mean, in a good sense, he's very aware mm-hmm. of all of the labor that goes into every film and what what it means. And with Model, it's like the labor of all these different characters. You know. Yeah. And but back to um, Models by Ulrich Siddel, he's more interested in, I believe, the character, the, the the his the characters, right? Whether th- they are real characters, they seem to be real girls that he found that were in the the Austrian modeling um, uh, uh, world. These aren't supermodels. These are wannabe models. Right. Uh, uh, I mean, we call them essentially, they probably got low-level catalog and commercial work that was specific to probably Austria, is my guess. These weren't international models. Yeah, of course. Um, and... Instead of going to jobs, which there is them going to jobs, you see that, um, and them dealing with a photographer specifically. Um, but it's more of like a desperation of like being the main character is Vivian, mm-hmm. and uh, she's scared shitless, literally, about growing old and being irrelevant and not being pretty enough. And that obsession is, like, literally tearing her insides out because, like, anytime you see her at her house, she's having, like, a mental breakdown. And she's on the toilet usually. Yeah, or taking laxatives and just, like, or stress eating. So, right. um, A lot of models is the girls at their favorite club, nightclub, and they're all usually in the bathroom talking shit. And, and it's great. Um, again, if you're listening to this and you haven't seen it, the the lines blur between non actor actor and documentary subject. Um, if I was to make a guess, and again this is a guess, he found real models from the modeling a- industry, hung out with probably a bunch, probably, right? Yeah. Hung out with a bunch, sat and probably connected with a few of them, and probably filmed them and said, "Hey, will you guys talk? You know, talk about." Uh, men that are in your life um let's discuss x y or z i would love to know how he plans these shots out because there's in many ways there's the 
shots that are them in the mirror of the club. It's a lot of them going to the club, doing coke and drinking all night, waking up with bad hangovers, having talk about different guys that they're in their life or that they want to be in their life. You know, again, searching for happiness. And And they even, like, talk about, like, taro or, like, all kinds of stuff. It's all mixed in with, like, what do you do to get ready for your jobs? Like, oh, I, like, I, I, (laughs) there's, like, this one scene where they're, like, working out together side by side. And she was, like, on every full moon, I swim naked in a lake. And then I, like, listen to classical music, right. and it helps. And, and I, I put fish oil. I put fish oil all over my body. And it helps her skin. And then the other girl's like, oh, that, that shit doesn't work. I just do, like, tarot cards. And she's like, no, you got to do it the right way and see a psychic. Oh, yeah, <laughs> That's yeah. what no, I yeah. <laughs> And it's, again, there's a hilariousness, and there's a despair, and there isn't a kind of moralistic judgment of, I don't know, in certain films about models, it's like, yeah, aren't this film, again, isn't, and much of the film is them partying and doing coke and then fucking and trying to find connections. Um, it To me, it isn't a moralistic set of judgments of, God, your reality is so shallow. This isn't some obvious kind of mess about how uh, their lives are so stupid, but rather, um, you know, we saw how people connect through animal love and their animals and their dogs with models it's a set of humans who girls which uh, are girls, complex and right interesting. and they happen to be in the modeling industry and the ways that they choose to find connection the, connections through their existence and and it's their relationships their and their, uh, yeah, yeah right and totally. specifically also lots of talk about plastic surgery um later on the film there's a subplot um where vivian uh this is the of uh, this was like maybe the most obvious uh fictional drama aspect where she finds a photographer who's like a total sleaze bag who implies if they fuck mm-hmm. he'll give her um a good job and you know she gets the good job but it doesn't really lead anywhere um and again I, that we can talk more about that part but uh it's it's not like Again, there's a judgment against these girls, and I think that's what's important. He's, no, uh, he, yeah, go ahead. no, no, no. Yeah, I, I just think it's not about him also protecting the characters, whether they're real or not. Um, it's this kind of uh, letting it all out, like showing all the cards. This is the and subject. even what they don't, they they're not really aware of necessarily about themselves like right right they have so much self-consciousness yet they can't understand their own desires for connection and how those things are empty yeah are Um, meaningless okay if we talk about the beginning of the film really to me the film truly begins with it's them in the car. vivian and what's the other vivian and lisa and lisa which lisa is has tons of botox breast implants you know looks like a plastic surgery out person even though this is like the 90s um she has duck lips uh but and it's them like finishing up doing lines in the back of a taxi at like it, you know at 7 a.m yes. 8 a.m the sun is and, coming out uh and, and she's like I'm so wasted. I'm just going to keep doing lines of right. coke. And, and the, I don't know if, you, if you've ever been a coke head or if you've ever done a lot of coke. The next parts we see is both of them unable to sleep. Uh, Lisa in her clothes trying to le- sleep and, and uh, desperately calling anyone because you can tell she's coming down off blow and she's getting into that desperate uh, depression state that you can get in when you're coming down. She's drinking vodka trying to sleep. And then with Vivian... She calls her mom. She sleeps a little, and she calls her mom. And then they have, like, a talk about her career, why she isn't, like, hanging out with her mom anymore. And she's like, are you doing any nude photoing? Like, are you taking nude photos? And she's like, no, I haven't, but why shouldn't I? All all famous people get famous by doing that. And then, you know, she goes and visits her boyfriend um, and 
this is kind of the beginning. The be- the movie kind of begins with her feeling like, ugh, I've got this boyfriend who shows up late and he's totally not on my level. I'm going to like sleep around and try to find some connections, have some affairs, have some fun. The characters, you know, are trying to find a kind of balance and contentment in their life. And uh, I think... Um, I don't know. It's really interesting. What are some of your notes? Like, what are things Amelia wrote? Like, tons of notes at watching this film again. Yeah. Um, I've written just kind of scene by scene stuff about like each each girl, like naming what what they're doing in each scene, and just then, so like, you wouldn't forget. Yeah, and basically, I think like my favorite kind of plot narrative through it as loose as those those are is like she so she has a boyfriend who Vivian. cares about her mm-hmm. named mm-hmm. warner and every time they're home together they're fighting mm-hmm. and she's like oh you're cheating on me and like then later in the film it's her and her friend talking about their boyfriends and like dating and stuff Mm -hmm. and she's like you know i just like want my boyfriend to cheat on me so that i could cheat on him right and like so she's kind of like always in the midst of of sabotaging her real life or any kind of like normalcy that's outside of her yeah or contentment yeah and um and so her and her friends like keep having these conversations about men and stuff and her friends like oh you know t- teaching her the game more or less of like being detached as a girl and um like a, if a boyfriend hasn't said i love you yet like don't don't go about it in this way of being like do you like me like or whatever and so she basically gets advice from her friend how to be just like a a cold stone cold bitch to to dudes to get what you want out of them and so she she kind of picks that up and and kind of goes with that throughout the movie as she has these one night stands with dudes and she like but she starts to feel also like an aversion to intimacy and then like eventually she hooks up with like a a photographer who's like probably the biggest photographer that she knew around and it's just like this total empty messy like sloppy sex that just is meaningless and she can't she can't get what she wants out of that which is like your moment like he was promising that he deliver this this moment. moment and in fact he knew how to play that game which she was like trying to use on him like mm-hmm. way better than than she thought that she did right right so she's just another girl to this like dude and her moment was just gone in that in that it's like an instant where seconds. we see her in a ton of like more high quality makeup clearly doing some kind of photo shoot but we never really even are referenced it again and uh, and again i like that certain threads don't go anywhere because it's not about the job and it never really was it was about finding that uh, c- contentment and happiness um, in a permanent way right which... and and it just never leads there she keeps hooking up with guys um, in the bars these moments just keep passing and they by. get worse and worse the, the the guys that she hooks up with become more weirdly losers dangerous or losers and, yeah um, and again they're like when she me... she hooks up with the photographer he like orders pizza and then like they start like grossly throwing he throws this pizza in her face in the bed and so it's just like this kind of like sloppy like horrific, dirty horrific yeah. sex yeah, yeah. um <laughs> i think um we were talking about this you know so much of his films aren't films that rely on a lot of dialogue but models is this exception where there's tons of great conversation and dialogue between all the characters and whether that was um, a comfort that all the, the, you know, actors slash subjects had with each other and with wise men finding girls that really had. And my 
theory, he must have had to find a group of girls, like the four women that are in this movie, feel like they're friends or they've been friends for a long time yeah. with the way they talk to each other. Um, and he really, like, to me, just got the fucking jackpot with how the ease of, of, of how they talk to each other. Because with Animal Love, with Dog Days, with Import Export, um, a lot of dialogue isn't the point, or which is fine. Even though Dog Days has some important dialogue sections, which we'll talk about, but uh, this one is the the outlier that feels like it's all about um, interesting conversation regarding life, or even the absence of, you know, the banal conversations they have are like a negative space that say everything that they aren't saying, you know, um, and I think it's he really to a certain extent peaked at least in one level although again i agree with you import export uh, has so much beauty and heart to it and a lot of love to his characters where uh, there's not as much of a detachment um but yeah i don't know if there's anything else we need to say about models except that it's just so fucking perfect um uh, I, I always think about the character Lisa, even though she's kind of a secondary star to Vivian's story. Um, Lisa is like kind of like the uh, Samantha of the group, I guess, if we're talking she's about sex in the city. Older. She's older. She has more plastic, more plastic surgery. surgery. She doesn't give a fuck. She like specifically uh, yeah. does all the coke that she wants, goes off. And uh, her friends are constantly making fun of her or like, telling her she's like going too far and you're wasted it. and yeah totally like oh she's like um her she, friend asks her like has anyone noticed your new boobs yet and she's like she's like no you know like i don't even tell the difference like to me i like can't it's the same to me and she's like she's like really because it's like overt to me it's like it's actually like the first thing i noticed so it's like <laughs> such bitchy conversations yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like but then there's like this love and like af- affection and that they give each other that's yeah. really pure like that they're you know they hug each other in the bathroom and dance together when they're by themselves and like you know that's the thing again i say there's no moral judgment because then we go to like scenes of them in like an empty bar cafe dancing with each other and the film i think the way it's viewed like loves the characters and, and and has nothing but good feelings for them even when they're searching for meaning in their life it it isn't mean right at least that's the way i see it when we talk about other documentaries and i hope one day we can talk about american movie which is one of my favorite documentaries ever made which a lot of the um kind of dialogue and discussion surrounding that film especially when it came out in the late 90s early 2000s was are they making is this film making fun of its subjects is it meanly laughing and um you know filmmakers like todd salons definitely thought it was the, they're laughing and meanly like careerists making fun of the work the 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 simple people but i would disagree I'm, anyway i'm on fun of tangent on american movie but needless to say i don't think i think uh rick uh 100 uh has an affection for his characters okay so now we're moving on to dog days which was considered basically uh Seedale's breakout American film. So Dog Days was, I think, you know, it had a real producer. Um, it, I don't know if it won, but it was in like the Venice Film Festival. Um, it had a lot of good reviews, although a lot of bad people hate it, hated it too. But it, I guess it had a lot of like um, people supporting it. Um, so it was kind of 2004. It was a time when. Um, independent film was something that was promoted i think a lot more widely um weird outsider you know Lars von Trier films were popular they you know they were breaking out to where people were willing to you know watch dogville or uh breaking the waves or something like that or dancer in the dark and i think uh the market was more open to saying oh certain american audiences are down with weird foreign films okay let's try to push them out and um dog days was i think one of those films this is my guess that it was kind of in that world of 
weird indies that they gave to the American market because animal love and models, I can say as a, you know, back in the 2000s, I was a teenager. Uh, neither of those films was available in America. At least, I'm sure there was VHS copies, but I, I wasn't aware of them, you know? Um, and so I can remember, although I didn't watch it, I remember Dog Days being at least available at video stores. Um, and Dog Days is interesting because it, it's promoted and talked about as Rich Siddle's first uh, true drama um, where he wrote a script and in a lot of interviews he's like this one was different than like you know animal love and models because i i wrote a script and we shot over the course of three years and um but i would say in many ways it's still like his other films and that there's clearly clearly you know he, if he wanted to find a certain type of person he would go out and find that person you know what i mean mm-hmm. and um and i think there's definitely some uh, professional actors in it too, but I think it'll be interesting to talk about this one because this is a film that, even though it's at least at that this, you know in the 2000s it was his most popular film, I think it has a lot of it has certain issues, and one of those issues is the desire to have a traditional kind of three act linear narrative where he's trying out beginning, middle, end in a way. Although we were talking about now, models is very chronological, but um, I think it it doesn't have the kind of traditional like story like and then vivian discovered who she really was or you know or anything vivian is kind of stunted in the end anyway you know she doesn't get that kind of happiness um i think dog days has an issue where there's some really interesting weird characters certain stories but some of them feel like a little too like i had this weird idea for a narrative and it just feels very artificial. Yeah, or like I have to make an end right. to this idea yes. that I had. Right, so... Like it can't just be this perfect middle part, which we see in parts of it where the middle of it the, the, didn't the part... have to lead to an end. Right, exactly. So, you know, uh, for people that don't know, Dog Days is like a bunch of different small stories about summertime in the suburbs of Austria and you have a old man who's obsessed with his lawn who uh gets his um maid to like wear his dead wife's dress and like have dinner with him and like strip for him um you have a couple and this is actually the the stuff i don't like the most there's like a couple a man and a woman whose child died in a car wreck but they still live together in the same house, even though they're broken up. And then like their stories that she has like a date with a man in the house while her ex-husband watches the whole time, like detached and angry. That one is like the most, like there's some desire for this, like catharsis. Um, then you have some of the better stories is this female character who f- talks to people at like shopping parking lots what would you describe what does she do she can only basically recite these facts about commercials and like pop pop culture yeah Yeah. and it's like basically she'll go up to people and asks them for rides never and yeah and there's never like a destination she always gets rides with random people at these parking lots of stores and then we'll just talk to them about inane like commercial pop culture stuff and then we'll start asking them about their personal life so she has no social skills or manners or manners and there's this kind of and i'm okay with it this kind of um surreal like there's a kind of punk like Mm -hmm. this is this anti this character that like dish that is um, all that she has is what's around her. With all, you know, all that she sees is this suburban wasteland of shopping malls and highways that lead to nowhere. So the only thing that's in her mind is like the reflection of that kind of cultural wasteland, right? At least that's the way I see it to a certain degree. And I like that it's constantly her um, arguing with or fucking with those people from the suburbs and I get some people might listen to this and be like, oh, God, it does feel like a kind of punk art project. But I think it works really well 
the, the film fucks up in that they just I like that we're never shown a place that she's taken to. She's like in this zone of nothing, of like of nowhere, of no home. Mm-hmm. But yet there's this subplot where this character who's again one of the other characters of the film is a security systems guy who goes around asking people if they want security systems. And I, there's some stupid plot element where like he has to find who's like destroyed some people's cars or they'll fire him. So he uh, picks her up and like tells these people that this is the person who just who vandalized their cars and she gets raped and it feels like very plotty. It feels very like this is the, like you said, like here's the, the beginning, middle and end. The girl connects with the other story by being like fucked by these awful suburbanites you know yeah the kind of political message becomes so on the nose that it just doesn't work and unlike the other films that we talked about animal love and import export those films don't feel like uh there's this specific moral judgment or political judgment not to say that politics isn't a subject of either of those two films but he allows the characters to breathe and be who they are. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean by that? Yeah. And in this film, it feels very scripty. And I'm like he said, you know, it feels like these, this is the stories that I need to tell. And it doesn't play to his strengths because I think his strengths as a filmmaker are taking characters that are who they really are and allowing them to be, he, he nudges them into interesting places. Right. By giving kind of really broad instructions while they were yes. doing something natural to what they were right. doing. They're like, as long as you say, as long as you like spit out your gum and, and, and like in this scene, then mm-hmm. you can do whatever else. Right. Like, and, and I think, and I think what's interesting is that, uh, another aspect that the, one of the, best parts of the film is a, is uh, some characters we actually see the least which is he clearly found uh, a, some boy that was like some kind of weird uh, car dude like some car freak is what he calls them it's like a like a, a techno Austrian youth did who, he find that guy at, at like a club yeah like is a, that what or, like a, or he found him at like a car show mm. and it's like this dude whose girlfriend is a go-go dancer and he, the film is just different parts of this guy yelling at his young girlfriend. Those are some of my favorite parts. Yeah, and just this. being like verbally abusive to her, and well, and physically too. And physically too, of course. Yeah, we'll get. Yeah, we'll um, get to those. Like, yeah, there's an amazing part that's Amelia's one of her favorite parts of the film, and mine too, where the girl. Or do you want to explain it? Sure. She's like, dropped off somewhere. And has to like walk to meet her boyfriend in this like, empty parking lot. And her boyfriend's already, like, waiting in his, like, souped-up purple car. Right. And she's, like, walking across the parking lot. And he's, like, basically pretending like he's going to, like, hit her with her car. So the car's, like, swerving around, almost hitting her. And then, like, he stops, opens the door, and she, like, gets in. And then they get in a huge fight. It's yeah, like... and it's amazing. And it feels like no, I don't think they're necessarily really getting in like some awful fight, you know. But um, it feels like real characters doing things, and he's just kind of nudging them. Yeah. Um, another character that I like a lot, and I think we like a lot, is like a woman who is older, but she was clearly like a beautiful woman in in the past, or still is to a certain extent, and she has like an awful abusive older drunk sleazebag boyfriend and there's this great kind of um subplot of she gets all ready for her boyfriend and you see that he's just this disgustoid and there she's drunk and she clearly like wants to fuck this guy but he brings some friend of his like some younger friend of his and that guy like sticks his fingers inside of her it becomes really uncomfortable and awful for her. And they just get more and more drunk. And do you want to explain what? Sure. They just start humiliating her. They ask her to sing. Yeah. Just because she was like kind of vulnerable and like wanted to be sexy. It's like just the perfect way to get off and like for these two guys. And it just, they kind of like vibe off of each other's like 
horrible, sadistic evil, behavior. sadistic behavior. She starts, they tell her to sing, and she starts singing um, basically beautiful opera and she's like singing this opera as a kind of rebellion and then they force her to sing because they're trying to get her to sing la La cucaracha Cucaracha. and they like drunkenly sing la cucaracha and it's just this mess and she gets humiliated more but then the film fucks up in its scriptiness by later on there's like a whole again later like a third act plot where the, one of the characters that was drunk feels bad for what he did, so he takes a gun and forces her boyfriend to, like, say sorry to her and sing for her and, like, stick a candle up his ass so that she feels better. And it's this kind of, like, revenge thing that just feels so cheesy. It feels unreal. It neither. It's a something that would never happen. That woman would be abused by her husband or her boyfriend, and maybe she'd leave... But she sure as hell wouldn't get revenge on him in that mm-hmm. way. And no, some other guy wouldn't help that. And again, another thing that I hate is, to me, it's like, um, don't use a... I hate, you know, to me, like, the filmmaking rules, like, don't use guns to get what you want. Like, using a gun to make a character do something is such a cop-out. Like, if you're going to do it, just make the... Write a better script or have a better character... You know, using it, pointing a gun at someone and saying, okay, now apologize for what you did is such a, an easy thing. Do you get what I mean? And I think, again, he's making mistakes, right? There's interesting scenes. And then his writing partner or his producer, whoever it was, was like, okay, we got to fix this. We got to let her feel better and get revenge so the audience feels better about. Yeah, how- we humiliated her. Right. So, like, yeah, let's give her her, like, her chance the, to. to sh- yeah, to and, get back at him. And I think what's interesting is we could have, I would have just watched a film about, you know, the car freak and his his girlfriend. Oh, there's the scene. Um, oh my god. Rather than sorry, I was like trying to find the scene. Uh, rather than all these kind of plotty elements. Oh my god. Yeah. And I think, um. What it does, though, is there's amazing elements to the film, and there's plenty of good scenes and scenes that you wouldn't see anywhere else. Um, but there's it because at some point it starts to feel quirky in a way that's like later Harmony Korine, where it's like, I'm a huge fan of Gummo. I, I also love Julian Donkey Boy, but as Car- Harmony Korine went on, a lot of the stuff felt like weird, quirky scenes, you know? Um, Mr. Lonely... And uh, and I like Spring Breakers, and I like Mr. Only, but a lot of it felt like this kind of quirky, goofy scenes that lacked rawness that Gummo and Jolene Donkey Boy had. And um, I think he starts to fall into that in his own way. But um, right now, we have the, the car scene on um, of the girl trying to walk to meet her boyfriend while he zooms around her. Um Okay, so I think we can move to the last film, which is Import Export. Are you down? Yeah. Do you have anything else? Really, I mean, no. I think I'm good. All I can say is that the the car freak boyfriend and the girlfriend look so perfectly two thousands. Like he's got like a shitty tribal tat around his arm. He's wearing like uh, bad silver necklaces and cheesy Oakley type shades with gelled hair and a tank top. Like it literally looks like total perfection she's wearing butterfly clips is that what those are yeah. called uh, they look like completely perfect 2000s euros you know yeah. what i mean <laughs> so now we're talking about um or its final film um at least in in our little thing import export now uh this was made in 2007 this was the first Ulrich studio film i saw i saw it in 2009 like i said before on a torrent um, so, you know, this isn't the last film he made, by the way, he's made a whole other set of films that people really like. Uh, but I feel like this is his last really, really great film. Um, there's a lot of humanity in it and beauty in it, um, and despair. And so it's a film that, uh, you know, I think finally he got the perfect mix of actors and non-actors in this one where he probably did write a script for this one, at least an outline because of the film is called import export. And it's, um, a girl from the Ukraine and the poverty she lives in trying to find work for her and her 
son or daughter or child. And then on the other side of that, we see the life of a guy in his 20s who lives in Vienna, Austria, as he tries to make his life at first with work and then just trying to do something to find connection and love. Both of them are. And um, we see themes that Ulrich always messes with, which are themes of finding, trying to find love, trying to find meaning, trying to find hope. Uh, better life. A, yeah. a better life. Um, sexuality, uh, death, all kinds of like kind of broad themes. Um, but this one is very stark, you know, it isn't as, although there are strange and interesting and weird people, it still feels very grounded in reality where dog days felt a little too goofy to me at times. Mm -hmm. Um, I think he really got the swing of what he wanted to do. Right, to find that mix, to allow it to be. Because there are these moments of his, of his direction that are that make something completely mundane into a little bit of a surreal moment but it's something added that it could be it could happen totally in real life and the, it, these stories yes right and it would co- it, go, it would go completely missed if you were actually in that moment but it's yeah it's these, these are the strange people strange little things to me you know added. his films and specifically this film is about people that we walk by every day in our life and we ignore in the stories that are occurring within those people's hearts you know their consciousness yeah. yes and okay so you know we're shown this girl from the ukraine at first uh working uh in a uh, nursery for newborn babies then she works at a cam like a like you know a sex cam like streaming like little house little like setup room that these girls have to work out of then she goes to austria and she becomes a nanny and then she finally works at a place for people that are dying that are old so for her her journey is literally the journey of life and death yeah. from a baby to sex to family and to finally death and to some people maybe you'd might roll your eyes and be like oh that's so obvious but it's it's very subtle you know what i mean with the the, the work that she does you know so much of the character I feel awful. I don't remember the character's name, um, but she has these two very specific. Olga. Olga has two <laughs> very specific outfits. How would you describe her outfits? Uh, they're like, well, it's freezing cold outside, so the coat that she's wearing is made for fashion and not really comfort, and that's like her entire outfit. Yeah, and she wears high heels these little like white boots everywhere even though she has to walk miles yeah in the and like snow. the cold and she it's so like, she, it's like you know she's projecting like it's almost like live like dress like you want to live you know like right. that kind of ideal like you're like you're dressing how you wish that you lived even though like the reality of things is like different so than worse. how you want it yeah. yeah and it's like the way and i think she... she only basically has two outfits because she spent all her money on those right outfits. yeah poor people only have a couple yeah. outfits and she walks with this like fuck you attitude of like i'll I... be in the cold but i'll wear these high heels and this like super tight outfit and i'll be freezing but this is how i feel on the inside this is who i really am um yeah. this is the pride that i have there's this beautiful Antoine Daggett poem that actually reminds me of like of what you're saying like the way she walks and like Is, I'll have, have to it? read it okay. yeah. yeah do you want to find it yeah let's find it, it. so this is this poem yeah I'm just we're adding another some more Antoine Daggett quotes yes, yes. <laughs> um, a freak walks the streets she has worn out hands and arms of a cleaning lady. But the sharp angles of her face reveal a restless and domesticated animal. Her burnt hair, blonde with dark roots, gets looks. It hangs down and caresses her hips, slipping down the skin of her naked legs. Never-ending legs whose ankles buckle at every curbside, at every manhole cover, at every air vent. 
She is proud of the click her wooden heels make against the asphalt. And though she winces in pain from time to time, she quickly purses her garishly painted lips again in a scornful pucker. Many men would like to taste that scorn, but nobody approaches her. Her self-assurance seems to protect her. Alone, the street vendors dare to follow her down subway steps and throw peanut shells up under her skirt. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, no, I totally feel it. Um, I think, you know, I think this film it, it is one of the films where you can really feel a kind of, like, there's just a lot of um, political stuff about labor and work and immigration and what people do searching for a better life and those that do when they go to a place like the Ukraine where they're searching for sex or like a kind of freedom. That's something that people I don't think talk about enough is, you know, Olga goes to the Ukraine to find a better life. Right. And then, uh, the guy. the male character and his stepfather go to the Ukraine first for a work trip, but then to like basically get a prostitute and get fucked up. And it's like they, to them, it's, they get, they basically escape. They, they escape the, their the rules. They're in a lower middle class mm-hmm. lifestyle in, in Austria. But when they go to the Ukraine, they feel like, oh, well, we're rich here, right? Well, they're not, but they can like afford a shitty hotel and they can kings. pretend to be more than they are. But really, you just see this disgusting, bleak debauchery. Although at the end of import export, uh, basically the stepfather, this guy's stepfather, gets a prostitute. And it wants him to fucking have a three-way with him and the prostitute. And of course, the ma- the boy, he's not a boy, he's in his 20s, is disgusted and leaves. And he actually leaves the entire town. I don't know if you remember at the end, he, oh, asked, yeah. he asks like a woman if she has any work. But then she, of course, says no. And he just tries to hitchhike, uh, hitchhike out of the Ukraine, which is it's fucking squeak. crazy. Um, Disgusting. He like refuses, tundra. though, to be near this man. He doesn't want to be part of it. He doesn't do that act. He doesn't. In, and that's oh, maybe yeah. his saving grace to a certain extent. Not that there's a need for that moralistic aspect, but he chooses not to be part of it. Here, you want to? Re- we could also check. Um, so to me, um, this film f- also for the first time really feels like he's using the camera in a way that he does he hasn't before. Mm-hmm. In the other films, the camera is set up, feels like it's set up like a still camera where it's like him with a tripod and he's filming like a square right and most of the characters will be on couches or if they are moving they'll be outside and the camera will be like generally still or it'll move a little bit but with this film the camera's finally following the characters like we have a lot of shots of him following olga she walks through the barren like tundra feeling of of the ukraine and her like you know neighborhood yeah Everything that's still and in frame is a, as like a resting point where right. everything else is like following her going th- about through the her. physical labor of her yeah, life, right? Yeah. Not to say, yeah, he does have these these perfectly balanced shots that he loves to do. That's still there. It's very much a Oryxidial film, but he's um, opening up the way he chooses to shoot. Maybe also it's because of different cinematographer. I don't know, but um, I think. It's just interesting to think about her. She, you know, first tries to work with the children in the baby uh, hospital and gets no money at all. So then she decides to, f- to fuck it and do sex work and works at the cam. Because uh, it's not like doing a cam show out of your house. She has to go to this building in some, bo- in, you know, in some neighborhood where it's you're basically like given a room and a shitty camera to like do cam sex work and you probably have to pay you know half your money to the people um and she barely does it well i think they have to all know german and english because of those of the uh, main Con- uh, yeah the country or like the people the who customers are watching her, yeah. yeah and and so she like it's kind of this f- interesting part where it's funny at first that she can't know like German because the girls are trying to teach her how to say like dirty sex words like Mm -hmm. in German and she's like giggling and then she goes in to her first day and doesn't know German and this guy 
just get so angry on the other side of the cam just being like super dehumanizing yeah dehumanizing her because she can't like she can't understand what he's what he telling wants, her to do because he wants her to like stick her fingers up her ass or yeah she's just and so finally she, she says fuck it and that's that move to just go to the ukraine because to her even a job like sex work doesn't even pay enough you know yeah and then uh, so she gets that she gets like a letter from, from her friend, friend who already that, lives in the uh, that says uh, that Austria. She can come and work. She got her a job or something. And and it's juxtaposed to the guy on his first day of his security job. Mm-hmm. He loses the job. So it, it, this film is like the juxtaposition of both sides, of like both narratives of the guy and the girl. They're, they're, everything's happening almost at the same time mm-hmm. and leading to their, their import and export into like the crossover of the countries right and um so that's like this kind of like it's something good happens for her and something really bad happens for him right right yeah and he she has this desire to like move across whereas for the male character you know it's him working as a security guard uh the opening of the film or part almost you know pretty soon in the beginning it shows him training to be a security guard but they can't even afford guns for them or like actual training ground. So they're just like running around doing like, I don't know. It reminds me of someone was like, Rusty, can you design like a, an athletic training for me? They're just running in circles and yelling basically. And he's completely unprepared and goes and acts, tries to be a security guard cause he wants to be tough and he wants to be a man and immediately gets, um, basically like pranked slash like beat up by a group of drunken dudes in the parking garage of this mall he's supposed to protect so his first day he totally gets fucked and gets Mm -hmm. fired because he just fucks up um and then um he keeps trying to like search for you know people are running after him because he owes money he can't he can't create any kind of real identity for himself so he decides to go with this you know his mom's husband slash boyfriend and that's where this trip to the ukraine ends up going um i think instead he's searching for power at least the way i see it to a certain degree he's searching for like a kind of expression of you know he feels powerless and foolish and stupid and uh they both get to like express this feeling when they go to the Ukraine, whereas Olga is searching for like stability and love and family. And she has to leave her little child too, to take care of it essentially, which is something that poor people have to do. They don't even get, you know, the privilege of being with their child while they do work for them. There's plenty of immigrants, like people from Mexico that never get to see their children because they're just working for them. And, um, I think it's, you know it's a really interesting thing like you said olga goes to the west to find to find stability and to help her child and the male character goes to the east to goes to the ukraine to feel this illusion of male dominance and power you know he wants to like indulge in that power that he feels like he longs for, you know? Yes. Um, And, yeah, he doesn't really realize, like, how far that goes until he's, like, in it. And he sees this male, older kind of father figure completely, like, debauched and degenerated into, like, nothing but this disgusting, like, creature that isn't even human to him. And he rejects it at the end. Um, It starts off with, like this counterbalance between this overindulgence you know longing to take part in that kind of indulgent power of being like this privileged or maybe like you have more money than these people and you get to go and take part in all of this stuff and like it it continues and continues like you could there's no end to that but then on the other side, there's this conscience that just won't quit. Mm-hmm. And it kind of, it's this back and forth between binging 
into this kind of like no identity versus having this conscious, this need and longing for that identity to be found, which what led him to that place was all of this, you know, emasculation and, and, and being treated less as a inferior, inadequate in, in right. guy. To his, to his family, to his, like, he has no girlfriend, he has no friends, like, he feels completely lost. There's a great scene where he's, this is our animal love, by the way, our dog is, like, really going off, but I love it. Um, this, there's a scene when they're in the Ukraine, and the man and his stepfather go to a, um, I mean, I don't know what else you'd call it, except for, like, a kind of, uh, a it must be like a Romani gypsy uh, uh, kind of ghetto because um, it's like a huge empty apartment building that's like completely falling apart and he's trying to find a prostitute and there's this deep fear in him. He's worried he's going to get beaten up or robbed, which, you know, of course he already has been earlier in his life in Austria. And it's just like uh, he sees this, poverty and uh this kind of fucked up darkness in the ukraine that they're going to have fun in and all they can do is run away from it you know that's not the kind of sex that they want they want glamour they they want power they don't want to like indulge in this kind of poverty even though that's what it's there for i don't know i I just that's the connection that i felt to where it's so obvious um i think also there's a beauty in, again, similar to the best films that we've talked about, where he's not judging the characters. You know, you can dissect the films, this film, Import Export specifically, and look at all the kind of political statements about labor and about um, immigration and also people in the West going to places um, where there's, like, a difference in, like, money. But... It's also just two different portraits about two different people searching for meaning. You know what I mean? Yeah. And and I think there's a lot of love and uh, I think we're on the, empathy, even though it's an overused word right now. It's definitely true. The right. film really, I think, culminates for Olga in that she's in this old folks home taking care of old people as they die. And uh, they are the last kind of... I don't know, weeks of their life, some of them, and some of them have completely lost their mind and like senality. And they, all they can do is make sounds and they're like little babies, little children (coughs) drifting back off into non-existence. Like babies are drifting onto existence. Yeah. They're going back to this simple childlike experience or something. Yeah. And it's, I don't know. It's a beautiful thing. That's just on its own, something really interesting. (coughs) Um, okay, so the, we talked about all these films and uh, this filmmaker. He, again, he's made films later on in life, and there's some there's some really good ones. Um, but I think for me and for Amelia, these are his best his best ones. Um, so hopefully, I'm sure we will talk more about um, different filmmakers and films we love. Um, but it was like a really fun week just like watching films. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and I hope because of the way that a lot of these films aren't obviously like easily like findable that people can like search for them, you know. This was like an amazing like time just talking about these films with you. And I'm sure we're going to do more more interviews, more analysis of albums, uh, more talk about our favorite films and artists and you know i hope this has been like a positive set of episodes and a positive podcast for everybody so um i'm rusty kelly and i'm amelia mckay thank, thank you thank you мама мама тебе песенку споёт нашу песенку хорошо сердце тебе не хочется покоя сердце Как хорошо на свете жить, сердце, Как хорошо, что ты такой. Спасибо, сердце, что ты...
Ты умеешь так?